Hey Storm Nation, I'm Steve Klemkin, and today we are going to bring in five different bowlers, all with different skill levels, and we're going to explain what can be at times a very complicated concept, which is going to be that of the weight block or core of the bowling ball, what's on the inside of the bowling ball, and how that creates and affects ball motion. So let's get to it. Okay. So what's your name? Kenzie McLean. Okay. And how old are you? Seven. And have you bowled in a bowling league before? I did a bowling league when I was five, and I won two trophies by myself. All my right. first five. My Good first job. one was a 99, and my second one was a 98. Oh, really? Awesome. Well, that's good. Have you had your own ball before? Yes. Okay, but you've seen also in the back that there's also those racks of all those different bowling balls with different colors and covers and styles and weights even, right? Mm-hmm. Have you ever thought about what's inside of your bowling ball? Well, it's a core that... Um, well, listen to her makes the bowling ball move because it's really heavy and then it makes the bowling ball tilt. Now you know a lot about bowling, why is that? Um, it's because my dad works at Storm and yeah. it's because I do a lot of bowling. Do you ever notice that when you roll the ball that sometimes the ball curves or spins in different directions? Mm -hmm. Do you ever know why that happens? It's usually why the um, core is shaped. That's right. Based off of what we put inside that bowling ball is going to control or affect how much spin and how much curve each of those balls create. Good job, Kenzie. That's awesome. Thank you for joining us. I am the shipping coordinator here at Storm, so anything small package-wise, um, freight-wise, I handle scheduling all the shipments and getting all the bowling balls out to all our customers and distributors. And you're also a league bowler as well, right? I am. Where do you bowl at and how long have you been bowling in league? I bowl at Logan Lanes. Uh, I've been bowling for the last 10 years. Oh, okay, nice. And when you go bowl league, how many balls do you bring with you? I usually take three. Okay, so triple roller. Do you have three of the same ball or I'm assuming you have three different balls? I have three different balls. I, I take my spare ball, um, a ball that's a little more aggressive to start the night and then something that kind of dies down. Okay, cool. And when you're looking at arsenal of equipment, you mentioned a spare ball. There's a lot of people that consider the spare ball to be the number one ball in your bag because I don't care how good you're bowling, you're going to leave something. Now, regarding the other two balls though, you said you have one that's more for a heavy oil, maybe when the lanes are a little bit fresher, and then something for when they dry out. Did you know that there are actually not only just a variety of cover stocks or the outside part of the ball actually touches the lane, I'm assuming you have maybe one that's polished and one that's sanded, but we also have some different levels of aggressiveness for the weight block or the cores that's inside of there. And they're kind of broken down into two general categories. The first category is going to be your symmetrical shape, which is a little bit more of a balanced, a little bit more stable design. Generally better for when the lanes are a little bit drier, you need something to get down the lane a little bit easier. Or a stronger asymmetrical shape, which is like what you'll have inside the proton physics here which is something that's gonna be designed to generate an earlier, more aggressive, maybe a, a stronger move off of the spot and something that can handle a little bit more oil. Now that's just the core shape or the inside, but like you mentioned, you have a couple of different balls, uh, maybe that have some different cover stocks as well. Bowling in the same center, same lane surface, same oil pattern, for the most part, three balls is enough to get you by. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I noticed it is a world of difference from bowling at the lanes I bowl at to even bowling in here. It's That's right. two different worlds going from bowling here to taking it up to Logan Lanes. I had to make a few adjustments the way I bowl there to how I bowl here. Awesome, Kyle. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks. So, thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, my name is Chris Walker. I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. Bowled here since I was nine years old. Uh, it's been quite a while. I like to travel a lot, uh, do some tournament bowling uh, all over the nation, bowl some ABT tournaments. Uh, national tournaments, that kind yeah. of stuff. So. Hey, in fact, you actually won one yeah. of the ABT Nationals. Yeah. Uh, Tell us about, about that. a year ago. Um, we bowled that ABT about a year ago and won a $20,000 tournament in Las Vegas. Yeah. It's a lot of fun, a lot That's of pressure. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Now, when you went down and bowled that tournament, how many bowling balls did you bring down there? Um, for that one, I brought down uh, nine bowling balls that I had with me, um, three different tournament bags. But um, I mean, it ranged from all kinds of things. I had a urethane at one point. I had uh, pearls and solids, uh, reactive, that kind of stuff. So. so you had some balls with some different shells, say different surfaces, material, solid, hybrid, pearl, 
maybe like Nano Extreme NEX, like in the Axiom, for example. Nanotechnology we've had for quite a while in the line. This, uh, the NEX cover stock on the Proton Physics is our, one of our newest developments, very aggressive shell. Uh, but you used equipment that varied not only in the outside or the cover stock of the ball, also you brought some equipment, I'm guessing, that had maybe some different shapes inside the bowling ball. Right, yeah, right? the cores, yeah. Uh, for sure, I mean that's that's kind of the reason why you use different bowling equipment because it has all those different, the technology inside is so much different for each one. And a lot of times when you get lined up, say you get lined up on the lanes and you're using a particular bowling ball, it may work great for a couple of games, right? But yeah. then what happens? Uh, I mean, you experience the breakdown on the lanes, uh, pattern changes a little bit depending on you know who you're bowling with, that kind of stuff, and so you got to kind of really watch that on the lanes and kind of predict what's going to happen next and, and make the adjustment on that before it happens. So you're going to have a variety of different balls and as long as you know which ball you transition to from one step to the next and it may be a, a little different layout, it may be a different core design or weight block design. This for example, these are two pucks that are inside the bowling balls. Look basically the same volume right. but hold these two. Yeah. And you can notice one is much yeah. heavier, right? That dark, dark colored one is much heavier. Now the heavier it is, that means it's a very dense material. That means it's going to have a much lower center of gravity, it's going to rev up a lot faster and it's going to handle much heavier oil. So you're going to use a weight block whether it's asymmetrical or symmetrical in something that has that kind of material here because it's going to create a lot earlier break point for you which is great when you're tournament bowling. So thanks for being here today Chris, I really appreciate that. Hope that hopefully that helps you understand a little bit of what goes on inside a bowling ball and then the expertise is going to come when you're out there trying to know exactly which ball to use at what point. Right. Well, I appreciate it, Steve. Thanks. All right. Uh, Coach Mike Jasnow, I want to thank you for joining us here today for our show. Hey, Steve. How are you doing? Yeah, doing great. Yeah, thanks for coming. And, uh, you know, you've been a friend of Storm. You've, uh, you've been representing Storm now for a long, long time. For 20 years. And you've been coaching at the highest level for uh, an equally long amount of time. <laughs> and you've coached a lot of professional bowlers, a lot of high-level tournament bowlers. For those of you watching this video, you likely have seen Mike Jasnow uh, when you go to bowl the Open Championships because you've been giving lessons there for over 20. over 20 years. So in a nutshell, what have you seen when you, you know, when these players come to you and they, they come for a lesson and they take their equipment out of their bag and then they're like, okay, I want you to watch me throw it, evaluate my game, evaluate my arsenal. Well, I've seen both the good and the bad. And some of the bad things is they'll open up their bag and their newest ball is like 10 years old. Which is probably not going to be working great, except for maybe spares. Yeah. <laughs> Oils are different, and the cores and covers are different. So that's a big part. That's true. The other mistake I see people making is they might have three balls, and they end up doing the same thing, where they might be a symmetrical and an asymmetrical, but they drill them all differently to make them react the same because they like that reaction. And then they're kind of locked into one thing. That's true, and that is a good point, because there are a lot of players who, when they get a new bowling ball, for example, there may be a certain layout that matches their style. You know, I'm thinking like Pete Weber, for example, when he gets his ball, he's going to keep it somewhere near the center line of his grip, which is about five and three quarters, six inches or so from his pap. One may be up, one might be down, right. but he's not going to drill anything too crazy off of that because he is trying to get an idea on exactly how each different ball is going to fit into his arsenal. Let's take this core, for example. This weight block is a more stable design. Let's say it produces only, oh, let's say maybe 60% of the amount of flare that a more dynamic asymmetrical shape is going to produce, right? So let's say you're measuring the amount of flare that Pete Weber is going to get or one of your customers. Right. You know, if they get seven inches of flare out of this with that particular layout, they may get only, say, four inches of flare out of this one. Now, what's going to happen? Like you mentioned different layouts. What if you drill this one you're afraid it's going to hook too much and now so you drill it more stable or you're afraid this one's going to go too straight so you drill it up a little bit more aggressive what happens they end up being the same yeah exactly <laughs> you know so i think it's a good you know try to find out what what a good drilling is for you and your game uh, and it's going to be different for everyone and just kind of like the shape you like seeing on the lane that appeals to your eye and then when you get a new ball try to stay very close to that same drilling so you can really see the difference from ball to ball yeah and when you're going to bowl a tournament, there's a lot of times, I mean, just speaking from your experience at the Open Championships or at the World Series of Bowling, for example, the players aren't going to know exactly what they're going to be competing on and how their ball is going to react on that particular day at that tournament. 
So what's going to happen if you show up and all of your equipment kind of does sort of about the same thing? You're either, it's either going to be a great day or, or it's going to be a really rough day. And the lane conditions transition, right? Absolutely. Well, I think it's not realistic to think you're going to use the same ball and play the same place for all three games in team event. That's probably not going to be a successful strategy. Yeah. Uh, on the fresh condition, yeah, you want something smoother, more controllable, stay in the pocket. But once they open up, you can let it wheel and you need equipment that will allow that. Another good thing is when you practice, take out all your equipment, find out the difference from ball to ball. So then when you have to change, you have a pretty accurate guess of where to stand and where to play and be in the pocket the first shot. So it doesn't take you three or four shots to get lined up. Yeah, it's, yeah. and if you go in there without that willingness to change or adjust the equipment in your arsenal and, and go from ball to ball and be able to move your feet and adjust your speed and your launch angles and stuff like that, that's kind of the stuff that it takes in order for some of these players that Maybe they do average 220 or 225 at home, but when they go to the Open Championships, they struggle to, to average 200 to shoot even. Yeah. Some of these kind of differences are what I've seen kind of make that difference. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you on the lanes. Appreciate it. And remember to always bowl up a storm. That's right. All right, and lastly, folks, we have four-time PBA National Tour Champion Marshall Kent here to dig into some of the finer details of weight block design and strategy. Now you've won four times on the national level. We're not even talking all of the medals you've earned on Team USA and such. But to win at the highest level, chances are you're not just grabbing one ball and playing one part of the lane. I mean, there, there's throughout the course of a tournament, you have to have a variety of different strategies. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, and that's one of the hardest questions to ask, answer when I get asked that question. is like, what ball do you like to use on this condition or where do you use this ball? So, well, I answer most of them with, it depends. You know, a lot of it depends on uh, the center you're bowling at, the, the lane surface, uh, the oil uh, pattern, the conditioner they're using, the lane machine they're using, even to the point of like the temperature outside. Uh, it's a very case-by-case -case scenario that uh, requires a lot of instinct, a lot of experience from past tournaments, and it's just a lot of it's just trusting your gut and trusting what you know and with the shapes of the balls that you have in your arsenal. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot that goes into that that we could sit here and talk for hours yeah. for. <laughs> well, at the most recent time when we saw you bowling on TV here, you were using a high road pearl. And what do you kind of characteristics do you see out of a symmetrical shape like that and a really clean cover stock? What does that do for you? And, and what are you looking for when you go with that strategy? So a lot of times with symmetric balls, I see a much smoother, longer transition uh, from the hook phase to the roll phase. Um, it's more predictable, more controllable, and it tends to work on more patterns than an asymmetric shape. And what I see in an asymmetric shape, uh, when they're good, they're just about unbeatable. Yeah. Uh, but they have a much quicker transition into a roll phase. So a lot of times they're good on the longer patterns because you only have uh, 10 to 15 feet of uh, down lane where the ball has time to hook. Yeah. So you want that ball to get to a roll really quick. But it also works really well on short patterns too because on a shorter pattern, you want to get the ball into a roll really fast. And um, you know that's another one of those kind of it depends scenarios so <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you heard that folks but that was a very very important point at the highest level you will see a lot of our national staffers like Marshall go to these high-end low RG high differential asymmetricals with the the high intermediate differential not just on the heaviest oil longest patterns but actually on the very short patterns and sometimes we can also accomplish the, the motion we're looking for by adjusting the layout. But what other kind of physical adjustments do you make as well when you're incorporating that kind of a strategy with release? Anything with speed or ball roll, anything like that? Well, it depends. <laughs> Again, um, a lot of it depends on uh, how much urethane balls, uh, how many urethane balls have gone down lane because urethane balls are, because they're a different cover stock, they carry oil down lane instead of pick it up off the lane. So it pretty much makes the pattern play anywhere between two to 10 feet longer, depending on how much goes down lane. So um, a lot of times we'll throw the asymmetric core to get that ball to stand up before it sees that carry down down lane. So it doesn't come into play as much as it would if we were taking a cleaner ball. Because now all of a sudden you have that carry down coming into play. And now you don't really know when your ball is going to hook and it just, it could miss that window. Or if it sees that window too early, it's going to take off and go high. So. A lot of times we want to get that ASIM core to, to stand up and it, it just uh, works out to be a much better shape. And, and you know, one of the things too with the asymmetricals is that they, they aren't all 
created exactly the same, right? I mean, you can't just categorize and say every ball that has an, a mass bias that's engraved or a PSA that's engraved on the outside of the ball is going to perform exactly like the others. There's different materials that go in these weight blocks. There's different shapes that we use that CAD software to design and develop exactly what we're looking for that's going to have different characteristics. Maybe on a certain layouts, you're going to find that this ball transitions in a different way than what you would expect or what you would see out of a different asymmetrical shape. So it's important to know that we also change the degrees or the amounts of asymmetry. Yeah, and I've had plenty of asymmetric balls that roll extremely similar, if not identical, to symmetric balls. Um, a lot of it has to contribute to layout, obviously, and core design and the material in there. Uh, the one that kind of sticks out to me the most rec recently is the original physics. Uh, that's one of my favorite asymmetric, asymmetric balls of all time. Great series. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's because my eye likes to see the shape of symmetric balls more often because I grew up throwing mostly symmetric balls anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's that asym kind of, it's that asym core with a symmetric shape and the combination between the two, it's like it has that bigger core so it never misses that window that I like to see the ball hook in. Mm -hmm but it also shapes off it like a symmetric ball. So I feel like I can be aggressive with my speed and hand, get it to hook from anywhere, and it's gonna shape and keep continuing through the pins better than most balls would, so. Some good advice, and shaping through mm -hmm. the pins is important too. You know, one of the most common mistakes that we see a lot of amateur players make is they try to get the ball to continue to hook through the pins and later and farther down the lane, and maybe the ball never gets into the roll phase, and you've stressed that, that you're, you're looking for a ball that goes from skid to hook to roll, and that it's rolling through the pins, it's not necessarily still trying to catch up and kind of find its place in the world right there. Yeah, a lot of people like to see that that super aggressive down lane motion. That's not, it looks really cool when you do it, yeah. and you throw a lot of messengers sometimes yeah. doing it, but yeah. it's not good for score-wise. You're gonna average 170, 180 if you're a pretty good player. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter how good of a shot maker you are. If you have the completely wrong ball shape in your hand, it's going to be impossible to score, or almost impossible yeah. to score. You mentioned, you know, lastly, when you're talking about the physics that you like so much, um, having that neutron core that's inside of there, this is our new proton physics. So this is going to have a stronger solid cover stock, the NEX solid cover stock, but still have the same core dynamics and the same core shape. You're going to see a similar roll pattern, but this ball is going to be able to handle more oil than what the original physics or the astrophysics did. I feel like, I haven't thrown it yet, but just kind of seeing the numbers and uh, the cover stock and everything, I feel like I'm gonna be throwing one of the two. I feel like the phys physics is gonna come and play on uh, higher friction surfaces when I kinda need a little cleaner cover. And then harder surfaces like uh, pro anvilanes, uh, especially with heavier oil patterns, I feel like this ball is just gonna cut through that oil and it's still gonna have that same shape that I like to see through the mid lane and down lane because of the core. So um, I'm honestly really excited to throw it and it's yeah. probably going to be a staple in my bag here for a while. All right, Marshall, that was some great stuff. Now remember folks, when we're talking about core design here, we're talking about the shapes, whether or not they're symmetrical or whether they're asymmetrical. And what that means is how evenly distributed that mass is about any particular axis on the bowling ball. So there's an X axis, a Y axis, and a Z axis. And based off of the angle that we're actually looking at that weight block, that mass is going to be distributed in a different fashion. And when we're looking at this, we're also talking about the radius of gyration or how far away that center of gravity is from the actual geometric center of the ball. We're talking about differential, which is the amount of flare that you'll see out of that bowling ball. And we're also talking about the intermediate differential or what is the degree of asymmetry. There are a lot of different components when we're looking at a weight block. We're talking about core volume. We're talking about lots of different materials. These, these are painted orange for the, the display right here, but there's lots of different materials that we add that adjust and change the density of the material for different components within the ball. And all of these things put together help create different ball motions. You're looking at, you're talking about RG planes. You're talking about axis migration. You're talking about all these different fine tune points. We've had the vector layout system, the VLS, and we're, we also have a VLS 2.0 that we've recently introduced that helps you find the right layout in any particular bowling ball for your game and for that particular lane condition. And all of this science is all bundled up into one, which is why we love bowling. We love the science of bowling. And I tell you what, there's a lot to know, but we try and package it in a digestible way and make sure that you have the best opportunity to bring home titles on the lanes. I feel like I know a good amount about it, but that stuff's still way above my pay grade. I, I'm, yeah, I've even, I mean, even 
coming here a lot of times learning about some of the stuff I'm just just the, the little minute differences between you know just even the, the material that goes in the core alone let alone what's on the outside over the cover and then the layouts on top of that and then what it does with what it does going down lane player to player it's it's a lot of fun to a lot of, cool lot of fun to dabble there. into yeah awesome well thanks marshall thanks for being here yeah thanks for having me appreciate it we love it and thank you and remember folks to always bowl up a storm <laughs>